Hi everyone, it's me. <clears throat> Clearly still not feeling <clears throat> um, 100%, but feeling so much better than I was. And I wanted to tell you, uh, some of you in the class have reached out to me um, via email asking how I was doing, you know, wishing me well, and that was very sweet of you. And so I just wanted to say thank you for that. I'm, I'm not 100% for sure, but I'm feeling like, significant, like I feel functional now. Um, I probably should definitely like, probably definitely, I should, I should definitely, you know, um, rest and, and like probably stay in bed for the next day or so to get better. You know how it is when you're sick, you're like, you finally start to feel better, like, oh, I feel so much better. And then you're like, I'm just going to go do the things I normally would do. And then you're like, oh, I'm sick for a week and an extra week, you know? So I hear my mom's voice in my head, like, Alicia, get some rest. I'm like, oh, okay. Um. And, and honestly, like the last few days, I've not been able to really do anything, like just except for like watching Netflix. It, like seems nice. You're like, oh, I need a day where I can just, you know, a couple days where I can just do nothing. But when you know in the back of your mind, you're like, I've got 80 things that need to get done by like this date and like I'm doing nothing. Like just so stressful. So I'm like uh, kind of glad that I'm feeling better. I'm not going to overdo it because I don't want to prolong the sickness. But um, yeah. So <sighs> I think it was a combination of like, there was a cold going around like I know everyone was like oh my gosh is it something worse but this was clearly just a cold but on top of that and I think this is why I'm fe I'm feeling mostly feeling like shit is my oncologist um, uh, made some major changes to my medication and so I, I, I've shared a lot of my medical history with you guys about my past <clears throat> cancer diagnosis and and now I'm on I'm still on a lot of medication to keep it from coming back and We've had to switch some stuff because of some really bad side effects, thinking that this one would be easier and I would do better on uh, like these specific medications versus the other ones. And I don't know if my body's just adjusting or if they're worse, but I just, you know, I feel like an 80 year old in a 37 year old's body, like my joints are just killing me and I feel just so run down, so run down. And then on top of that, like that's been going on for the last few weeks. And then on top of that, I think I got this like this slight, you know, minor cold, and on my I was just like, no, you know, my body was just done. So sorry, so I wasted like three minutes talking about that. You guys didn't probably didn't care, but anyway, if you're wondering, like, wow, she looks like shit, right? <laughs> I didn't. I still don't have energy to put any makeup on or anything like that. So it's just you know, it's just me, um, no contacts or anything anyway. But you know, um, I it's not a big deal. Um, okay, so agriculture so before before we get into this so you just as a reminder um you have your second exam coming up like in a week or so so just like with before i'll be putting up the study guide and the exam documents you know so many days beforehand but also um i i received a few emails from students just hope, like asking if they could have had a little more time now i feel like five days for the study guide and three full days with the exam is more than enough time. But I like, I hear you guys. I, it was from more than one person. It was from a few people asking, like if we could just have, you know, one more day or something. And so, uh, I, cause I get it like sometimes your work schedule, you're like, oh yeah, three days is a lot. But if I work all of those three days, then it's kind of, you know, so I get that. So what, what I'm, I'll, and I'll post an announcement with the exact stuff, but what I'm probably going to do is give you guys like longer than I, than I had originally put in the syllabus. So, I think I have that it's due on like Wednesday, but I'll probably give you to like Friday or something. Like just so you have a few extra days. Cause I wanna make sure, I don't want anyone to be like, even though I'm like three days is plenty of time. But like I said, if you're like, yeah, but it's the three days that I'm working to 10 hours shifts, like, you know, so I get that. So I'm, I'm gonna give you guys a little more time than the first one. And then also, and, and this was something that a few people brought up, you know, I think on the first exam, students were, were reluctant to reach out and ask me questions. And I know I said, you know, feel free. And this is why I give you guys the study guide. And this is why I give you, um, you know, so many days to do the exam is because I anticipate that you might need clarification on a question. Or you might just want time to like, you know, do a little side research on it, ask a friend, review the PowerPoints again. And this is not, so I'm, as I'm already giving you a side note, I'll give you another side note. Um, I'll ne I'm never going to ask anything on the exam that I didn't talk about in lecture or isn't covered, you know, in, in the PowerPoint or bo both. 
Um, if I want you to really know something and understand something, I'm going to talk about it in the lecture. I'm not going to expect you to do like be a sleuth and discover it on like Wikipedia. Like I don't expect that at all. Um, so and you notice with the first exam, some of the questions are more are very. I'm looking for a very specific answer. Like if I ask you name like list and describe the steps of the scientific method, that's like everyone's answer is going to be basically the same, give or take. Um, but if I ask you to interpret like the picture with the ring, I got some really interesting, diverse, great answers from you that none of them were exactly the same and that was kind of the point of that. So they're open, you know. So some of them might not be exactly like, textbook answers, but I'm never going to ask you anything that you need to do like side research on. So keep that in mind. And then the other thing I was originally saying was that, um, you know, you have... Um, no, I forgot because I went on like eight tangents right then. I was going to say something about the question. Oh yeah, just like if, if you have any... Um, want clarification from me like please please feel free to reach out um, and um, like I said well I think that the time I give you is plenty of time this will give you all a little more time to have that opportunity to maybe even just like look at the notes and then just kind of think about it um, and I like I take effort into consideration like I, and for those of you who didn't do as well on the exam as you thought you might I mean you probably noticed this that um, you know, if, if I'm asking for half a page minimum, what I'm expecting is that you take this question or two parts to the or whatever it is, and you're gonna give me some, some thoughts on that um, to some degree. Like, you're gonna, you know, tell me the information, maybe depending on the question, give me your interpretation of it. Does I want, and you'll see in almost every question it says discussed. I wanna hear like a discussion, like, or I want to read that from you. I want to know that like, you're thinking through some of it. You can explain something in more than three words. You can explain something in detail, still keeping it concise. I'm not asking you guys to give me like eight pages per question, just half a page, but I'm expecting something from you. So if you are giving me one sentence, that's not like what I'm asking. And I'm, 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 I'm not expecting you to read my mind. I'm literally, t I told you on the exam, half a page. So. Hopefully if I give you guys a little extra time that I will allow you to maybe, you know, start those essays, maybe do one a day and have more time with them or do them all on one afternoon and then have another day to like step away from it and then the third day go back and like reread it. So like it's really up to you how you want to do it and I hope you, the whole point of this, I just wasted, not wasted, I just talked about this for like five minutes, but I hope that you all, um, you you know, utilize the, the little bit of extra time that I'm going to give you on that. Um, like I said, I, I hear you when you when you when you reach out to me, and I want to you guys to know that I, my my I'm not trying to trick you guys with these questions. I don't want everyone to fail. Like I want you guys to all pass this class. I really want you to learn something. And 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 I know I, I think the majority of you are not anthropology majors, so I don't expect you to, you to remember every single little thing we talk about. Oh, snotty girl. In the back. But there are certain things I, I hope that you take away. And, and in general, I want you to just like feel like you have opened your mind, have been able to critically think about some stuff, you learn something interesting. Okay, that's my that's my rambling on that. Okay, so anyway, like I said, I'll post I'll post it on Canvas like with the official dates and just so everyone's clear on that. But I will give you a little extra time for the second exam um, than I had given you for like on the first one. Hopefully that benefits everyone. And we're all happy with that. Okay, so <sighs> to the lecture, agriculture. Now on the syllabus, you saw that I had split this up into two days. So, so very likely I will do a part one and part two in terms of the videos. But as I like, as I was looking through this, I realized it's it's definitely one of those just like um, um, with some of the other topics in this class where they are longer when we're in class because it's, it's a topic that everyone has questions about and we have great examples and class discussion. And so you might be thinking agriculture, really, it, for whatever reason this one, because we end up talking about food a lot, people have a lot of things they want to say. So I'll try to anticipate some of that. Um, and, um, you know, um, bring that into the, the lecture, but so they might not, it might not be as long as I think. So this might, it, but I'm still gonna keep it into two, I think, cause I'm tired right now. So even if this ended up being only an hour long lecture, I don't know if I have the energy for that. So either way, it, they might be two really short videos, but just because in the syllabus, I don't wanna kind of make, like keep it in line with the syllabus. And the syllabus had agriculture for two days. So I'll do two, two videos just for everyone's ease, no confusion on that. 
Okay, so let's just, we'll go through this and I'll probably get through like, let's see, there's 32 slides. So I'll probably get to like, you know, slide, well, we'll go halfway and then we'll see where we're at. And then uh, I might, let me just call it. Okay. Slide two on the PowerPoint, it's called Agriculture and Economics. Now slide two, environment and technology. So, hold on real quick. Sorry, okay. I think, um, I mentioned this to your class, yes. When we were talking about Homo habilis and um, Homo erectus. I'm sorry. Oh. <clears throat> um, about we look at those different tool types and we see that Homo habilis had the old one tools, Homo erectus had the Acheulean tools, and there's clearly a difference between the two. Um, we could say one is more simple, one is a little more complex, the old one tools being a little more simple. But what I, I know I, I said this in the, in the video was that it does not imply that Homo habilis was stupid that they didn't know how to make something more complex. All it, all it, all it's really telling us is that they didn't need to. Um, in fact, we know like they had a fairly, a bigger brain than say like a modern chimpanzee, and we know modern chimpanzees are like very intelligent. Um, so if we have an animal who's smarter than that, um, making com like tools, like it, it, it doesn't imply anything about that Homo habilis only made the simple tool because they were they were simple and that they couldn't have, if the need arose, they couldn't have made something more complex. Like, the, all these things are like separate issues. We tend to like, like combine them all together. All it means is that they needed a simple tool for a simple task. Um, so this is similar when we're talking about like modern human populations. Then when we're looking at environment and technology, like this is a, something really important to keep in mind. We're gonna see this great variation of, of tools and weapons amongst whether we're looking at like a hundred thousand years ago or twenty thousand years ago or like even at like populations all living now but just looking at like different groups around the world we're gonna see a variation in, in well in everything but if we're specifically talking about uh, different technologies like you know tools and weapons and things like that that people are making from the environment um, that it's the same idea and I think I, so I have a, the, the quote it's like the third bullet point down necessity is the mother of invention so what we see is um, well one simplicity and complexity can be subjective terms so you already have to kind of be careful with that but even when when even if we're addressing them in, in a, a slightly more objective way we still have to keep in mind that just because that one tool might be more simple than another it doesn't imply that that group of people could not make something more complex if they needed to sometimes and we'll see this in different ways in different uh, groups around the world that depending on what we're talking about, you know, weapons, tools, um, um, cooking utensils, clothing, whatever it is, can be more or less complex or simple depending on like what aspect of the culture you're looking at and where in the world you're looking. That there's always going to be variation. It doesn't imply anything about that group that they couldn't make that other thing. What it typically implies is that they didn't need to. So like, for example, say you live in uh, by the ocean and you eat a lot of um, food, like marine food. Um, like a lot of fish and stuff. What types of, and I think I'm probably getting ahead of myself. I'm probably, I'm almost positive I am because I think this is on the next, it's literally coming up in a couple slides. Well, I'll just get ahead of myself then because I'm already talking about it. Um, what types of f weapons would you need or tools would you need to like capture and then process that food? It's going to be very different from the weapons or tools that you would need if you are taking down large game like on the savannah, right? So the the purpose of the tool is going to dictate like how the tool or weapon or whatever it is is going to be different. But also what's available in your environment as a resource to make that tool is also going to um, add to that variation. So you could be living in one part of the world where you're eating you know, fish and another part of the world where you're eating fish, but if the plants available or the types of wood available or the the stone resources that are available are different, your tools and weapons might end up being slightly different even though you're eating the same thing. So keep that in mind. So that, this is what I, the point I wanna make. And I'll, I'll, I will come back to it on the, I'm, I don't wanna get too far ahead of myself, but I give a more specific example I think in a second. But anyway, okay, so still on slide two though. 
but just keep that in mind that the environment plays a role in that so many different ways. Um, you and, and also like if you're thinking, well, in terms of like the complexity and simplicity, if we, if we were like subjectively examining groups around the world and saying, well, you know, this population makes these very intricate nets and this other population doesn't. Hmm, I wonder maybe this one population is just more, just better. But then you would, if you look at it objectively, you're like, well, they need nets because they're catching fish or, I don't know, small rodents, and the other ones don't need nets for anything. Why would they make something they don't need, right? Like, this is the point. Or why, why would you have, um, you know, giant spears if you're catching, if you're eating, like, lizards or something? You know what I mean? So, like, the size, the shape, the type of your tool or weapon or uh, processing equipment is going to be different depending on what's available in the environment and the resource doesn't imply that you don't know how to make something bigger or that you don't know how to make something smaller or that like doesn't apply any of that so I just want to make sure that like this goes back to those ideas we were talking about before about you know relativism and, and ethnocentrism that it's the same idea okay and then I have some questions here so like of course like I said what is the climate what types of vegetation are present what types of non-human animals are present is there water? So all these different parts of the environment are going to be are going to be a factor in all, in all of that. Okay. Slide three. Technologies help individuals adapt to different environments. Technology type does not necessarily imply intelligence. So that's already what I said. So like if you're looking at just on this these three pictures, you have a green, very green, dense forest. You have an open, you know, like desert, and then you have a very beautiful, like colder, like mountainous, rocky environment. You can already start thinking the types of clothing humans might wear will be different because of, of the of the environment, like w whether it's cold or warm, or but also their types of clothing will be different because what they're using that's available in their environment will be different to make that clothing. So. The types of food that they're eating will probably be different. So the tools and weapons that they might create to capture and or process that food, um, if it's an animal food, um, the vegetation that they're eating is going to be different. So the type, like if they might have different ways of, of you know, storing it or processing it because the food is gonna be different. So there's all this, gonna be all these amazing different types of technologies that imply nothing about the intelligence of that group. Um, if it's different from another group. Like, get that idea out of your mind. I know I've said like eight times already. Um, all it implies is that their environment is different and they are responding to that specific environment in a very specific way, given what their, the resources that they have. Okay, so slide four. So this is when I get into some more specific quotes. So here I have some, like as a class, normally we would do this as a class. So you see this picture, um, so we're, we're on slide four, you see this picture of like a desert and the first question says, what type of food might be available in an environment like this? So think about it for a second. Very similar to like out here, right? So you could say, okay, you know, what type of food? So like if we're talking about plants, we could say, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Cactus, you can eat cactus. I like cactus tacos one time. They were so good. Um, but like animal food, you could maybe like for like, okay, rabbits or lizards maybe. Um, probably bugs, bugs. Um, I mean, we could probably all list like a bunch of stuff. Probably certain types of birds, right? You know, okay. Question two, what type of food would not be available so I know you're only seeing like a small snapshot, but just like make a general guess. You could probably say, okay, probably fish, probably, at least not right here. Like maybe there's a river somewhere near, but like just according to this picture, probably not a lot of like marine resources, right? Um, probably not any, because when I see this picture, I'm thinking, I'm like literally thinking specifically like Nevada, right? Um, so I mean you could you could say okay let's just say we knew it was Nevada or somewhere around here you could say well there's not going to be any um, um, like lar like elephants or something you know what I mean like we so we could already imagine like a list of things that would probably be there things that would probably not be there um, based on what we can see in that picture so question three what technologies would be created for either food? So collecting or processing. So if you're like, okay, I'm gonna eat cactus, you might have a very specific tool to like making sure that you can, you know, collect part of it without getting 
stuck. I, that's happened to me. It's not fun. Um, or if you know there are certain areas where you can get water in the desert, you might have very specific tools to access that water underground. Um, if you're like, okay, we eat a lot of lizards, you might have very specific, like maybe small nets, or I don't even know how to catch a lizard. Um, areas where you section, I, there's probably, there's probably very specific tools that you would use. And then for cooking or processing after, uh, maybe you, there's a certain flower that you, or grass or something that's available that you might like ground down so you might have tools to process it. Um, so you're gonna have things very specific to that environment, right? And then question number four, what would him, oh man, what? No. <laughs> oh God, you guys, can I read? Would it imply some kind of intellectual deficit if the humans who lived in this area did not create the technologies that would be more appropriate for the food in question two? So the question two is what type of food would not be available? And we, and we were like, oh, like fish, right? So let's just use that, say this again. Would it imply some kind of intellectual deficit if the humans who lived in this environment, in this desert, did not create the technologies that would be more appropriate for the for food re, for marine resources. No, right? This is the I know you're know, like you said this like 18 times already. This is the, what I'm saying. It does not imply anything about the intelligence of a group of people who live in the desert if they don't know how to make or if they don't make um, tools or resources that would be used to catch fish. It doesn't imply anything. All it implies is that they didn't need to make that tool. It doesn't mean that they couldn't. They didn't have the ability. They wouldn't know how to if suddenly they were in an environment with fish. Doesn't apply anything about that. Okay, slide five. Okay, a couple terms. One is called carrying capacity, not carrying. Like, how much do you care? No, carrying. I know that's like awkward. Carrying capacity. So this is the maximum number of people that can be supported given like a particular environment environment given like the resources in that environment so when you have so like for example you could say like oh in the desert or like in in the valley let's say the vegas valley you know we can support with let's say we we're talking about just in terms of what the resources that are here like we get stuff shipped in but imagine it's you know like ten thousand years ago we could say oh you know two thousand humans could live in the valley and live off the animals that are here naturally like that's probably wrong but let's just say you know well because you know as you're eating the food it's regrowing you're moving to a different area there's you know but say suddenly there was instead of 2,000 there was 200,000 living off just what's naturally available like on the ground we'd be like whoa like it's, it's gonna be a problem right um, whether you're doing some kind of hunting and gathering, whether you're doing some forms of agriculture, it's going to be problematic. When, you, when you're looking at an area that has this finite amount of resources and you, you exceed the carrying capacity. So for any given environment, the carrying capacity could be, you know, a small number, a higher number, depending on what's available in that area. If there's like a, a river and it's very lush and green and fruits blooming everywhere versus a desert, where it, there might be resources, but it might be a little harder to get to, or there might be fewer and far between. Like, it's gonna be different, right? So, carrying capacity is important. So, and I talked about this with you guys before, population is really important. So population, in this sense, populations can make or break. Like, if the population gets too big or too, too large, it increases too much. Um, suddenly, if you have, like, if you're using agriculture, you might not, you might run out of room. Um, you might not, You might not be able to have that natural like um, cycle of you know we use this land and then we rotate every couple of years and then it just you know you might be over hunting and suddenly you're running out of resources because you've surpassed that carrying capacity so keep in mind that in terms of like we're talking about people and humans and environment so this is all gonna come into play okay slide six something called optimal what are we at 25 minutes okay optimal for um, You know, let's skip that. Let's skip that. Go to slide seven. Okay. Hunting and gathering uh, slash foraging. Okay, so, so some terms. So we talked before, please understand the difference between these. 
we talked before about scavenging and hunting with Homo habilis and Homo erectus Neanderthals. They were hunting, right? Scavenging, remember, was coming across a carcass and, you know, eating what's left over versus hunting is actively seeking out animal to kill and eat. Now we're talking about, but also remember, even for those hominins, Homo habilis, erectus, Neanderthal, they're still eating plants that whole time. And, and before then, we, that's all we were eating. I already told you guys, remember, like our molars, you look at our molars, we're classic frugivores, because ancestrally, evolutionarily, that's what we're eating for the majority of the time. It's only very recent that we introduced animals into our diet. Anyway, so scavenging, most of you know what hunting is, right? But so scavenging is that other term where you might come across a carcass of an animal and then you'd eat what's left. Now we're talking about something called hunting and gathering. This is kind of the same idea, like I said before, which is what we were doing, like with Homo erectus, for example. Um, they're hunting sometimes, but most of the time they're gathering. But it's a combination of those two things. You're gathering, like, you know, plant resources, and then on occasion eating um, animals that have been hunted. But recall, I told you this, a couple exceptions to the rule, but this, for the majority of human evolution, even when we're hunting and eating animals, it is a very small portion of the diet. Imagine, like, the, a meat, about, the amount of meat about the size of your fist once a week. Um, that's not what most people are eating in terms of like, you know, like, like if we, like, oh my God. Las Vegas, for example, if you're like, how much, if you're a meat eater, how much meat do you eat? You probably eat that much a day or more, right? Our bodies are not designed to eat that much meat. Um, especially, I feel, I know I'm repeating myself to you guys, especially the, the types of meat that people are eating, the, the, I mean, processed food in general, but especially some of the meat. Um, oh man, I'm already tired. Okay. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, but so, so, uh, but hunting and gathering is that, where you have a community who is hunting on occasion, gathering, it's a combination of those two. Foraging is the same thing. Instead of saying hunting and gathering, we say foraging. It's like, it just kind of means the same thing. It's, it's, it's a single term that encompasses that idea of being a hunter-gatherer. We just say forager. It's just, it doesn't put a separation between the two as much. It's, it's easier to say. So I know you're like, there's all these different words, hunting, scavenging, gathering, like, so scavenging and hunting, being a hunter-gatherer, and, um, Foraging. So I might say the word foraging or I might say hunter-gatherer and they're interchangeable. I usually say hunter-gatherer because that's how I learned it, but just know if you're looking in the literature, they might have used either. Um, okay. So like it says here, so you're you're using uh, wild plants. So you're gathering, you know, what's what, like, you know, plants and fruit and, you know, different types of, you know, seeds and grasses and uh, that are already existing in nature. You're utilizing those. You're not growing your own. And um, also, um, of course, you know, hunting animals that might be available in your environment. So this is what we have been doing, um, whether it was all plants or mostly plants and some meat, this is what we've been doing for forever. It's only, and I have here on the thing about 10,000 years ago that this shifted. Now, we could probably push this back. I think some more recent research research is showing that we could probably push this back even another thousand or like there's a little wiggle room but it's very recent it's very recent that we transitioned to types of domestication in terms of um, either animal or plant domestication it's very recent in human evolution and not every population does and there's no goal remember we talked about this before there's no goal whether we're talking about you know biological or cultural, there's no goal to for every population to be agriculturalist. Because I'll tell you, and we're gonna talk about this, there are some pros and cons to that. Um, so there's no goal. It's not like we're just waiting for everyone to catch up and be an agriculturalist. No, that's not. That's not. Some will do that, some will not. There are pros and cons and reasons why. Okay, so slide eight. Um, so back to some more stuff about hunters and gatherers and or foragers. There are still modern populations that exist today who are hunters and gatherers or foragers. Um, typically we see, and this is what the slide is showing, that these population, the population, the, it's the density. 
population densities are low. So even when we're looking back at like us, you know, like um, like all of humans, like in the past, when we, when we were all hunter gatherers, populations are low. And I know I've mentioned this to you before that for the majority of our evolution, we evolved in small groups. You know, imagine like 30 to 50 people, you know, give or take. We were nomadic or semi-nomadic, so basically we're wandering around. We're not staying at any location at any for any particular length of time. We're not settled in any particular area. We might have, you know, like in the past there might have been, um, you might stay in an area for a brief time, a few days, a few weeks, so you might have like some semi, um, uh, some stru you might have built some structures, but it wouldn't, you wouldn't be spending like two weeks building a house that you're gonna be in for four more days like that you know what I mean imagine if you went camping all the time you're like okay we, yeah we camp a lot but we only stayed at a campsite for you know uh, five days are you gonna start building a log cabin no you're probably gonna have some shelter but you're gonna have a really probably very efficient way of like you have a tent that you use you know how to either use stuff from the environment every time or you have something very simple that you can carry with you that allows you to build some kind of structure for a tent um, so keep that in mind, like if you're, and also if you're semi-nomadic or nomadic, you're, everything that you own, you have to carry with you. So you're gonna have fewer items, right? Or you're gonna be able to utilize, knowing where you're going, I can use that from that, from that um, environment or, you know, that resource. I don't need to carry it with me if I need, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then let's see what else. So the social unit is the family or band. Okay, yeah, I said that already, so. Um, your the group or band, you know, small group, and they tend to be egalitarian. So you might have heard this term before. Basically, it just means there's equality uh, at multiple levels. So there's usually no discrimination in terms of things like sex or age. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but we tend to see egalitarianism um, when we're looking at those foraging groups. Slide nine. Okay, I'm just going to repeat. Hunting, non-human animals, you guys are aware, gathering plants, of course. Non-human animal meat makes up a small por- I already said all this, oh man, okay. <laughs> You're like, how many times are you going to repeat this? Um, and vegetable resources make up the majority of the diet. In fact, like, there, are, there, there are these sayings, there's one that's like, um, because, because per this last point, sexual division of labor, there is a sexual division of labor that typically what we see is that females are the ones doing most of the gathering. We're gonna talk about this in detail. Males are the ones typically doing the hunting. Um, but like I said before, because the majority of the diet, diet is plants, that's the most important part. That's what keeps you alive every day because you might not get meat every week and, and even when you do, it's like once a week and you might not get it. So that's not typically part of your actual like you don't depend on that part but you depend on the the other the plant food every day because that's what's going to keep you alive every day um so that, like there like i said there's a couple of expressions like when a man dies like he dies but when a when, when a female dies she takes like three three more people with her because the amount of work that the females are doing are is keeping everyone alive on a daily basis uh, because of the plant foods that they're gathering so like this is so this is so involved and complex, um, but there are see I feel like I get into this later at, towards the end of the PowerPoint. I'm gonna just kind of skip it. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself now because oh yeah we do okay so towards the end of this PowerPoint I get into the sexual division of labor stuff more okay so I I won't go on a tangent right now we'll talk about that later, um, but I, okay so let's go to slide ten and. So we're talking about hunters and gatherers, and then now slide 10, now something called horticulture. So what we see in, um, sorry guys, my stuff. Um, what we see, like when we look through time and, and even some recent groups is that sometimes you'll see groups who practice what's called horticulture, who might have previously, like in the distant past or in the recent past, practiced, um, foraging, like hunt, hunting and gathering. And so if you're wondering exactly what horticultural is here, there's a video too, there's like a YouTube link, but like obviously you can watch it on your own time if you want. But it's just showing that there is some types, or some type of domestication um, of, of plants, for example, um, but it's usually on a small scale. It's, typically there's not, like this, the, the 
because it's a smaller smaller scale um, the technology tends to be a little more simple um, there's not like the stuff we think of when we imagine like mass agriculture like um, irrigation and stuff like that usually it's not the same way it's very like small scale but it but it is but but even though it might, might not be this, oh my God, I'm stumbling you guys. Even though horticulture may not be the same as like these mass like agricultural like farms and stuff, it is still a huge thing to suddenly go from, depending on what's available in nature, to making your own in some way, either making more of what nature has provided. Um, oh, oh, snotty. Oh. She's snotting, I'm stumbling over my words. Okay, baby. You okay? Oh, guys. Okay. Um, also, for horticulture, um, there tends not to be a lot of surplus. So when we imagine agriculture, we imagine that we're making all this extra. We're shipping it around the world, like for like you know, like modern. We are storing it in mass amounts for for years, sometimes, or at least even when we're considering like early agriculture, we're definitely storing it for a couple of seasons. It's a huge difference between with hunting and gathering. You're not storing or saving anything. I mean, maybe like for like a day, but you're not storing it for like next month. That's not how it works. And for horticulture, maybe you're doing that a little, but there's usually not a lot left over. You might be growing some stuff in your small little you know garden or small field. But that's not like you're being able, you can store it for like years to come where there's this massive amount of extra. You're kind of just, it's a benefit to be able to kind of um, manipulate nature a little bit. It helps you feel like we really want more of this one particular item, but you're not doing it on a larger scale. So, so pros and cons to all this stuff. Okay, slide 11, pastoralism. Um, so this is just looking at, Um, like the domestication of certain types of animals for um, not just for meat though and this is important um, for the for milk for the fur or the hair so here you see the example there's like sheep is a really good one or like goats where you might be using um, the hair or the wool for clothing for part of your building structures for blankets um, you might be milking those animals and drinking their milk, um, and then later you might also then be killing them and eating the, you know, their muscles, the, the meat, um, using their bones and stuff for other for other things. So so it's not just the 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 for food. It's these multiple levels of of, of using these animals for that. So <clears throat> we see that in multiple populations, and of course, like depending on what animals are naturally available, is going to then of course. Uh, is going to um, influence which ones you're using. Like if you're like, okay, we should probably take an animal and you know, round it up and maybe we'll use it for its milk and uh, hair. Maybe we'll eat it too. Hmm, which animals are we gonna do that to? Let's see, well, there's uh, this this thing called a sheep. It's it's kind of big, but it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a carnivore, like it's, um, docile sort of like we could probably figure out a way to corral it and you know eh. and uh, what else is available well uh, there's this uh, thing called like a tiger uh, you know it's probably gonna just tear us to shreds <laughs> you know so like it's no surprise when you're looking at all these animals that have been domesticated you're like oh they were like all you know for the most part a couple of except like dogs are kind of a weird because we it's not really the same relationship but like imagining like the animals that we milk and stuff, you're like, oh, they're all, you know, um, fairly docile, non-predators, you know, like a, some slight variation to that, of course, but. Okay, slide. Okay, I think I just kind of set all that. Slide 12, slide 13. Oh, so, so slide 13. And then, of course, some other important aspects to pastoralism in terms of like some of the cultural stuff when you get into like marriages and like um, that you might see like that be part, of, part of herds and stuff being given as gifts or part of like a marriage ceremony. Um, and also we see animals, you know, being used in certain types of religious ceremonies. So if, so if an animal becomes very important in your culture, um, maybe it's the animal that gives you, you know, milk and warmth 
and food, that, that animal might become very revered to you in your religion. Um, so it might be something that's sacrificed, or you might even see symbolic imagery of your god or goddess with that animal being depicted. So all these things are related to each other. Okay, slide 14. Agriculture. So now moving into like actual agriculture, like the way we think of like modern day, like mass scale. Um, well, let's not get into the mass scale stuff, but imagine even just the initial uh, agriculture. But so we have like, you know, for, for millions of years, we we're basically doing hunting and gathering. And then maybe we have some groups kind of transitioning to starting to kind of control the environment a little more. And then we move into like early, early forms of agriculture where it's a little bit more on a mass scale, not what it is today, but definitely you know, more than just a garden, let's say. Um, so even when we're thinking of like that and not necessarily like, because modern day we see like this, we're like, oh, this giant tractor, we're on slide 14. But even earlier stuff, you might think of like animals that might help you like plow the fields. You might still have very specific tools and technologies for like larger areas to, to do this. Um, there's gonna be some types of irrigation or fertilizer. So the process is a little more complex. Even when we're thinking about agriculturalists from like 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, that it's still going to be, um, there's going to be a lot more interesting stuff um, involved. And slide 15. So here's the question though, I'm talking about this transitions, I'm giving you some very general information, but like why, this is always the question, like why do we see this shift in human populations? Hunting and gathering works, it worked really well, we did it for a long time, some populations still do it, so why do we see some groups around the world transition to um, you know, these large scale uh, agricultural societies? Because it drastically changes everything else because now groups are not nomadic. They're, they're settled, they're living in one area for an extended period of time, for generations even, they're not moving around. So now we end up having permanent buildings and structures. Even we transition to having things like um, art and symbolism becomes a little more complex because now if you're like, well, I can do some cave art, that's just obviously very beautiful. Um, but in one generation and maybe a few generations later, you're like, well, now I'm not, you know, wandering in the wilderness. Um, now I have a, you know, like a, some kind of structure I live in, in one location, I might decide to build a statue now. So like the types, it's not necessarily better or worse or less or more complex. It's just we start to really see a transition in types of technologies and types of even art and symbolism that's just different now because our environment and how we're existing in it has become different. So just to kind of recognize that. Um, so like I said, so now we're, we're settling in these places. And so there are a lot of pros and cons. Also think about, and I think I, I go over this in a couple slides. I don't get too far ahead of myself. Yeah. I go over it in a slide, um, but the, the, the types of diseases that happen. Um, so like, this is what I have right here. So why does hum, do humans shift from foraging to agriculture? What are the pros and cons? So we have, on, on one side we have, okay, for foragers, we're, we're dependent on nature. We don't have to do much. We just, nature is providing fruit, plants, animals. That sounds good, you know? But then you might say, well, on the flip side, what if there's a drought and then, now you were dependent on nature and you could have been controlling yourself a little bit so but then you might counter that and say yeah but look at all that work you're putting into it and no guarantee so like pros and cons and also there's some other stuff in terms of health that as a forager your your diet tends to be varied so you get nutrients from many different resources you tend to get more of the nutrients that you need in your body because you're getting you know things that are just naturally occurring from different parts uh, in the environment versus agricultural society, especially early agriculture, um, tended to have what's called a mono diet. They might have been able to really mass produce a few different crops and that was really great. But if all you're eating is like only wheat or only corn or, you know what I mean? Like, or 90% of your diet's that, like that's not good for you either. Um, you're gonna be deficient in a lot of things. And this is like actually definitely, this is what we see is that we start to see on a massive scale, the first like cavities in, in teeth because of this and, and they're not getting any nourishment. Also now you're settled in more locations uh, for longer periods, you're not, you're not active. So now 
like at, through time we see like things like you know um, obesity and the problems associated with the health problems associated with obesity so like pros and cons to this in fact I took a whole seminar a graduate seminar a couple years ago about agriculture and at the very beginning of the class like the first day the professor asked us okay before we really get into the details of this class you know vote on whether you would rather live in an agricultural society or a foraging society and I think there was probably like eight of us in the class and it was like 50 50 split by the end of the semester we all voted again and like I think maybe maybe one person didn't but the rest of us all voted that we would rather be foragers after learning about all this stuff like the health implications and all this stuff it was like whoa that's crazy like it seems as, as far as we know now as far as the evidence is suggesting now that it's actually healthier for us to be foragers so then you know the question we well then why did we transition if yeah we couldn't have known what the future was going to hold with agriculture it might have seemed like a good idea but like why did we transition and now there's so many problems with it like it's just like ah oh, you know why why did we continue to do it and this is what usually um one of the things that comes up and one of the big arguments is population size is that and this is kind of this really interesting paradox or debate is people evidence is pointing to we know that when humans transitioned to agriculture populations human population exploded but we don't know which one came first and so it it's like okay let's say big population populations came first populations getting really big and now suddenly we have to find because because of carrying capacity remember nature's not providing everything we need we need to find a way to mass produce a bunch of crops so that makes sense we would transition to agriculture because it allows us to make more maybe it's not healthier but we can at least feed everyone but then the question still remains, why did populations get bigger? So then if you flip it and you say, okay, maybe it was agriculture that started first. We transitioned to agriculture and now we can feed so many more people that people weren't dying, people could have more children that weren't dying, so populations began to increase because there was more food for everyone. Everyone could survive and thrive and grow to old age and make more offspring. And But then the question still remained, but why was the initial, why did we initially transition? And so we don't know the answer to this question. We know that they happened around the same time. We don't know why. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there. I'll stop on slide 15 and we will continue this discussion about agriculture and health on part two. Okay, I'll see you guys on the next one.